The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Guess what? This day, today is my 100th episode of Patty's Page. Yeah, 100. So today, my guest is my co-host, as always being, Ted Terry Doran. Thanks, Patty. I was going to call you Ted. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. I've uh -oh. been called worse. I'm in trouble now. So here are the pics of the highlights of the shows that I did with Terry. So Terry, how about starting off, where would you like to go? Well, first I want to say it's quite an honor to for you to give me uh, your 100th show, give me in the sense of picking out highlights from the 18 shows we've done together. And I'm honored and I thank you. And I'm going to begin with my favorite spot from Patty's page, my personal favorite was with Kevin Leinier, who's a editor and reporter and columnist for the Fort Worth New Sentinel. And you know, in 1982, the New Sentinel, the evening paper, won the Pulitzer Prize for reporting for its coverage on the flood. Prior to that, Kevin covered some shows of mine, Theater for Ideas, in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. So when he was on your show, I said, Kevin, was the highlight of your career when you <laughs> reported on Theater for Ideas? And Kevin said, second only to the Pulitzer. So, <laughs> here's a clip. Kevin and I go way back. You know, I do this show, Theater for Ideas, and still do sometimes. But Kevin reported on it. Uh, oh. It must have been when you first started. Yeah, what year was your, f like 1980? Uh, it was around, yeah. well, the first show, I did the very first show on this Access channel. 1981. Rock and Roll mm -hmm. Friend or Foe, and your boss, I presume was your boss. Ernie Williams. Editor, yeah. Ernie Williams mm -hmm. was a guest. Ernie was also a guest on it. He's a guest on several Theater for Ideas show, and he did a lot to help mm -hmm. Theater for Ideas with publicity, and maybe he's the one who assigned you to cover the shows. Yeah. I don't remember you know, I don't the remember topic, but... Who assigned me, but I do remember coming to... Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we, more than one, you know, a few yeah, yeah. stories from time to time. Yeah, back then yeah. was probably 79. We did a bunch of shows, and, and uh, the New Sentinel was great, and had you, mostly you, but I remember other reporters as well. And we did a lot of those shows in what's, well, it was then it was the art school auditorium. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where. Well, I remember doing went. them, I think it was in the, the old library. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the old library, mm -hmm. both. And, and I asked Kevin one? if that was his greatest thrill in journalism or how he survived that to still be, be in journalism. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, as, you know, as I mentioned, uh, before we went on the air, uh, next to the Pulitzer, it's <laughs> yeah. definitely the highlight of my career. So. And sure. this is the highlight of my <laughs> career. I mean, Kevin Leidinger tell me it's next to the Pulitzer. Thank you. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I think I want to continue with Kevin because this is a tribute to you that you got, I think, a, a kind of a scoop. Kevin told this story about the Pulitzer and Ronald Reagan, and we'll see this clip here and just let him tell it. Uh, Reagan was president then and was in Fort Wayne uh, for the flood and then his support, I guess you'd say. Yeah. At the new Sentinel. All right. uh, yeah. And it's really one of the ones for which we won the Pulitzer back in 1983. But this was in 1982 when Fort Wayne had the second worst flood of all time. Uh, oh. which most people, uh, if, if you were alive there, then or here anyway, you would remember. Yeah. But, uh, and I know, you, Terry, you were here, uh, but, you know, Ronald Reagan, the president, we knew was coming to town. Uh, and for security reasons, they never tell exactly where he's going to be until the last minute. So the new Sentinel staff, and I think this is in like April of 1982, we all kind of got together 
and uh, tried to predict where the president would be. There were a few places in town where the flood was the worst. And so by luck, really not because I was smart, I ended up at Sherman Street right across the bridge oh, yeah. from the newspaper. And I got there before anybody else did. And so I thought, well, my bad luck, this isn't where the president is going to be. And I think I'm probably just about ready to leave. Yeah. When uh, pretty soon a bunch of guys in dark glasses and sport coats start <laughs> showing up with little you know, walkie talkies yeah. in their ear and I'm starting to think, okay, this is looking better. And then uh, some local cops start to show up and they start talking to each other. And I can overhear them, I'm just kind of standing around minding my own business and they start talking about, uh, okay, uh, we're gonna bring in kids to pass sandbags and uh, they started talking to the, to the kids when they got there and told, telling them, okay, you don't have to do anything until the president shows up and then start you know, acting like you're actually doing something. Mm. And I was only there to hear that because prior to that, as the media began to get word of where the president was going to be, they started kicking out all the reporters back you know, to the secure perimeter. Oh, wow. And of course, uh, if they'd have asked me if I was a journalist, I would have said yes. I was, but they never asked, and so I didn't tell, right? I didn't volunteer the information. If you don't ask, you don't And know. so I was there, the only reporter with an earshot of when basically they were setting up a photo op. And so every reporter in the country, and there were m media people from the networks with the president that day, as they always are, everybody in, in the country reported how Ronald Reagan showed up to help Fort Wayne fight the flood. And I wrote the story about how Ronald Reagan showed up and uh, put on a phony act for the media and actually got to interview the guy from Portland who lent the President of the United States his boots. Yeah. And uh, the end of my story was, you know, I asked him, are you going to take the boots and have them bronzed? You know, the President wore them. And he said, nah, I'm just going to put them back in the barn. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. They were there for the next 20 years. Okay. <laughs> Wow. I knew just how much that would cost now. Uh -huh. Well, we were talking on your 99th show about, I was, about Leonard Peltier, the Native American mm -hmm. activist, wrongly imprisoned for life for something he didn't do. He's become an international cause uh, for liberty and justice. And you have done more shows to your credit, I believe, on Leonard Peltier with call-ins from a filmmaker and from the uh, director of his defense committee. And so I want to show uh, some clips from Leonard, from shows you did about Leonard. And let's start with Preston, who's uh, a filmmaker who had an interview with a prison guard at Leavenworth. I thought this was just riveting television, and, and to your credit, he showed it on Patty's page. My name is Bruce Smith. I was an employee at United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth in the years uh, 1982 to 2003. I knew Leonard Peltier for about 20 of those years. American Indian activist Leonard Peltier has served 36 years in federal prison for the killing of two FBI agents during a shootout on the Pine Ridge Reservation in the 1970s. The evidence presented by the prosecution has since been debunked and proven fabricated. The prosecuting attorneys now admit that they could not prove that Peltier actually committed the crime. Over the years, Amnesty International has deemed him a political prisoner, and his release has been demanded by millions across the globe, including Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and the Dalai Lama. Despite proof that he was convicted on a basis of suppressed evidence, judiciary misconduct, and coarse testimonies, Leonard Peltier continues to be warehoused. The FBI is the hierarchy in the prison system. They have one or two agents assigned, and they do call the shots. Since his arrest, he has been harassed and abused by the FBI. The same agenda set to eliminate Peltier through the Bureau of Prisons continues vigorously still today 
amplifying the clear abuse of correctional power and misconduct by the FBI and the Bureau of Prisons. He's not a threat to anyone in there. He never has been a threat to anyone in there. And to keep messing with a man that is in such bad health, uh, it's as if somebody gets a, a special act money award if he dies on his shift. Leonard is so high pro profile, all the shots were called through the Department of Justice, FBI. Then we'll add some artistry to the show with your poem about Leonard, which we taped here at Shove Park with my brother Jan playing the flute in the background. It's just a beautiful piece of uh, filmmaking, writing, music. Yeah, Jan, uh, Jan knows how to play that flute. He's a very good uh, flautist. Yeah, and the setting, it was just it was a beautiful moment for Patty's page, I think. And I thought it was a decent poem, too. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tooting my own horn here. So here is a clip of Jan playing the flute and me talking about the poem. Hold on. This is for Leonard Peltier. Many moons ago, something had happened. What had transpired during those dreadful hours? The days that led up to horrible slaughters. Whose fault was it, people had asked why. In the end, Leonard was a Peltier for this ultimate lie. When will they let Peltier go? His hands are as clean as snow. Why are they holding him so? Will we ever know? Oh, Leonard Peltier, we're with you, son. Hold on. Ever since the settlers came forth in wagons, there was trouble with both races since day one. When the dust had settled, many lives were lost. And the precious lands the natives once held were no longer theirs to be hunting grounds. When will they let Leonard Pelcher go? His hands are as clean as snow. Why are they holding him so? Will we ever know? Oh, Leonard Peltier, we're with you, son. Hold on. Then, I think at this point, let's just see Leonard himself. I, I believe the very first show I did with you, Patty, must have been in the fall, I know, of, of uh, 2011. Right. And I showed clips from Theater for Ideas and various documentaries I've done. And one of those clips from <coughs> maybe my favorite Theater for Ideas show, certainly the most unique, powerful was Leonard Peltier calling in live right. on our show in the 1980s, late 80s, from I believe it was the late 80s, uh, from Leavenworth Prison. He's now in a different prison, but here's Leonard Peltier himself uh, on the phone. And uh, on June 26th, there was a firefight at the Jumping Bull uh, Ranch. Two police officers, two FBI agents, and an Indian man, Joseph Stunts, was killed. Four of us was charged. Uh, two were uh, found not guilty by a jury of non-Indians uh, for reasons of self-defense. Jimmy Eagle's charges were dropped. And uh, the, uh, we found, of course, uh, again, later on, <laughs> uh, documents from uh, that stated put the full weight of the American government on uh, Leonard Peltier and received a conviction. And uh, what they meant by that was uh, throw the law books out the, out the window because they were going to uh, get a conviction no matter what they did. I was not allowed, by the way, to put up a defense whatsoever. I mean, I was not allowed to proper cross, properly cross-examine uh, the witnesses against me. But when I came to putting up my defense, every witness that I called for me was ruled irrelevant. So therefore, I wasn't allowed to testify 
in my behalf, and the only, only witness I was allowed to call was a character witness. And, uh, of course, the end result uh, was a conviction. Uh, we also uh, had on the jury admitted races, which are, we all got, this is all documented. This is all documented. We had a, a hearing on it. She uh, made derogatory racial statements against Indians before she even knew she was uh, going to be selected to be on this jury. Then I mentioned uh, Delaney, who's uh, the director of Leonard's Defense Offense Committee. Mm -hmm. She's called into your show several times. Yes, she has. She's a very and, lovely person. Uh, one of my favorite bits, and I've been pleased and honored to be on all those shows with Delaney and Preston, and one of my favorite clips from Delaney was talking about the Occupy movement. Yes. I had asked her, Delaney, what I would know. Leonard think about the Occupy movement? And here's her here's answer. Your clip. Very, she's a very articulate lady over the world has a lot of potential for uh, the things we're talking about, the walk <laughs> that you uh, have mentioned, which is fantastic. Uh, so I just wonder what your uh, ideas are about the Occupy movement and if you know what Leonard thinks about it. Well, yes, I know, I know that Leonard's pretty excited. It, it, you know, a lot of us old timers were kind of wondering when the young folks in particular were going to wake up. Um, so the occupation movement is, is a sign of that. Many of us came up through the Vietnam era. There was a uniting issue there, um, you know, and I think that's probably what has been lacking in subsequent generations. But what we're seeing now is young people who um, have done everything to pursue the so-called American dream, everything that they were told they needed to do, uh, obtaining an education, for example. And now they find themselves in, in the position of they have nowhere to go. There are no jobs, and, et cetera. Um, the occupation movement is predominantly based on economics. However, it very quickly grew into something a little larger. Poem, song you wrote, No Work for the Masses, which mm. introduced this show, the Occupy Fort Wayne show. Yeah. And you wrote a song called No Work for the Masses. Your friend Stanley did the music and mm. performed it. Beautiful performance. Stanley Strobe. Yes. From where? From Holland, Holland right? He's from yeah. Holland. So you got international uh, flavor to your show. And I shot some video of a protest at GE about the wretched policies of GE and outsourcing all their jobs and not paying their workers who had worked there for years a decent retirement wage. So anyway, here's a clip from No Work for the Masses. Oh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. It's really riveting.
Now the next one would have to be along with uh, the second only the pullets are my favorite moment from Patty's page because you did a Christmas show and I stand correct I think that was an out was that no that was a 30 minute show yes it was and, and it began and you had asked me to read uh, the night before it was the night before Christmas and, that and what was made that face. special mm -hmm. was that my daughter came and is always special to me and always special when she's on a show with me was there with her nieces Jocelyn and Trinity and uh, her best friend Skyla. So we'll see a little clip from it was the night before Christmas. It's my pleasure to read this, Patty, and Merry Christmas to everybody. And uh, I want to tell you kids, do you know what's special about this poem besides being famous? That until this poem, it was the night before Christmas, written in 1822, I believe, uh, there was no mention of reindeer or sleighs. This poem changed Christmas so that now we all think of Christmas we think of Santa and his reindeer and up in the sky with his sleigh. So this was written by Clement Clark Moore and it was the night before Christmas. Went all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick that I knew it. So I've tried to pick out things that are a little bit controversial, social issues, uh, funny. And the next one is from Extend a Hand. I had written a play that kicked off the forum, a place called Happy New Year, Molly. And you were kind enough to show a clip on your show. So I have a little clip of Happy New Year, Molly, which is a one-act play about a woman calling in who's suicidal, calling into a hotline on New Year's Eve. And I was one of the actresses, Engineer. well, supporting actress on there. So you see me. So here we go. Earlier, before, I, it would have, I, it would have made a difference, but now it's too late. I, I do thank you. Now I'm going to have to go. But, it, but it's not too late. We, we can talk more. I've got all night. No, you get off at midnight. I, I want you to enjoy your New Year's Eve. I, I've got to go. Why? Don't you like talking to me? I, I don't have to go at midnight. I, I can stay. I want to stay. Of course I like talking to you. You know that. Let's talk some more then. I, I can't. I really can't. I, I, have, I have to get my papers in order to write a letter to Mark. Papers? What papers? What, what, what letter? Oh, you know, personal papers. My will, insurance papers, things like that. I, I, I've done all that, of course, but I, I have to make sure they're all in order and, and I have to write the letter now. I want Mark to find it so he'll know what to do with it. And I want to say goodbye to him. You don't have to do it right now. Wait a little while. I have to do it now. He, he'll be home soon. I really have to go. I, I'm sorry. So what am I supposed to do? Hang up like we never even talked and say Happy New Year? You think I give a damn about New Year's Eve? I'm sorry I put you through all this, but I... Can't you think of me as being happy? I won't suffer anymore. I'm, I'm happy. I'm the happiest I've ever been. Maybe it's the only time I've been happy in my whole life. Well, that's... That's nice. That's just wonderful. I'm glad you're happy because I'm not. I'm sorry. I really am. Add one other thing. Oh, is it? Uh, which is, 
and that is the show we just did, which is the last show I was on with <laughs> Ted Lynn, who's the oh, news director oh, 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 yes, of Wayne Ted TV. Lynn. Ah. You know, the part I liked about Ted, I thought he was a very friendly, down-to-earth man uh, with a big responsible job of uh, you know running the news department at Channel 15. But I asked him, you know, how independent is the news? Yeah. And he, this is his answer. Hey, here we go. Let's show this clip. Is our network CBS? And who is it owned by? Wayne is owned by Lynn Media, not Ted Lynn. Don't confuse that. <laughs> I don't own it. I just going to ask. Yeah, don't. Uh, that, that's. Uh, I always explain that. Okay. Uh, Wayne is owned by Lynn. L I N. Uh, L I N Media, and uh, we have I don't know 29 or 30 TV stations around the country. Wow. Uh, 15. The way I like to look at it is there are 15 newsrooms. Uh, we've got an East Coast, we've got some right here in Indiana, and then a kind of a southern tier of stations. So there are 15, uh, 15 newsrooms. Well, in addition to hiring these people and overseeing what they do, you have to, I would think, as news director, have some philosophy of what is mm -hmm. news. What, right. What's a news story? Why is it worth Wayne's time to go exactly. cover it? You know, and to the extent that people uh, either need to know it or, uh, you know, frankly, something that's interesting. You know, those are the sorts of things that we look for, look at, uh, and uh, you know, those are the, we make decisions every day about we're going to put a reporter on that, and then producers, you know, who sit. This is the final. Well, 100 episodes we have done. We're going to do another 100, aren't we? Yeah, you're well on your way. You've got shows lined up already, probably half a dozen or so that I know of. Oh, my stars, yes. I'm quite a busy little lady, aren't I? Yes, you are. And so you're not so bad yourself, kid. Well, thank you. <laughs> you know, what's really interesting, Patty, not only do you host the show, I mean, you've written poems. Uh, we've so showed two of them, or excerpts from two of them. So you do a lot of different things, and you and Bob, your husband, also run camera down at the Access Fort Wayne, so and I do call audio. you Mr. and Mrs. Access Fort Wayne. Oh really. my goodness, so yes. You do so much for the community. We get a lot of phone calls from people who want to do us to do. That's how I met you. I was one of those. I called you to run camera on my brother Rick's show, so thank you. Thank you, and thank you for coming on to my show, Terry Doran, oh, my 100th show. So God bless, and we'll see you next week.